All right, we're now joined by Paul Bigger, who's the founder of Circle CI as well as Dark Lang. Paul's also the author of a viral blog post put up on December 14th called I Can't Sleep. Paul, thanks so much for joining us here on CounterPoints. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And so I wanted to read people a little bit of your, of your post so they have some context for this, if we can put up this uh, first element. Um, you write at one point in this, in this really uh, harrowing essay, you write, I don't know what to do, but I know these are not my people. Who can work with people whitewashing genocide? Are we supposed to pretend it's business as usual as we send our friends intros, frolic at conferences, discuss monetization strategy? To Ed Sim, Erica Brescia, Michael Deering, and especially Matt Ako, we're done. I'll never pitch you again, never ask for help, never send intros or recommend you. I'm done with Bold Start and DCVC and Harrison Metal and Redpoint. I'm also done with Bessemer and Sequoia and First Round. I'm ashamed that these are some of my biggest supporters over the years, the people who invested in me twice, the people who helped, who advised. I cannot work with the people whitewashing a killing. The people know it's happening and who cover for it. And so, uh, Paul, um, c- can you give us a little bit of kind of context uh, about, you know, first of all, how you came to the decision to kind of write this post and what, what is, what is dark line? What is circle CI contextualize, situate yourself in the, in the tech world for our audience? Sure. Sure. So um, the circle CI is, is what they call in, in tech a unicorn, right? It's, it's a, it's a company that's worth a billion dollars. And there's, there's a lot of these now. There's, there's about a thousand of them. Um, and we were, uh, Circle CI was sort of early in the uh, in the m- most recent tech boom, the one that went from about 2010 to 2021, and was one of the you know one of the large companies in in a particular space called continuous integration, which is sort of developer workflow. Um, and so that is you know what, once you find one of these, you're you, you have a certain cachet in the industry and you find it easier to raise a next round um, and next fundraising round you know you, you you know a lot of investors you you've built up your network you're sort of you're sort of in a little bit um, and so that, that that's sort of like my position in the industry it's not you know I'm not like Brian Chesky or, or Mark Zuckerberg or anything like that I'm like two tiers down but I'm also not the bottom tier uh, or not not the people who are just sort of uh, joining the industry. And so the the context for writing the blog post was simply like, how can we do business as usual during this thing that's going on during during the war on on the people of Gaza? Um, you know they're they're at the time, the you know South Africa had not invoked the genocide convention, but I think it was clear to anyone who was paying attention that that there was a genocide going on. And I kept seeing, pro-Israel posts. And I kept seeing people who were saying basically Israel had the right to do anything it liked, or uh, in in a couple of cases, uh, people focusing on what I considered to be, what I still consider to be uh, pro-Israeli propaganda. So for example, the the focus on uh, on Harvard, on Claudine Gay, on on the you know, anti-Semitism at universities, those are all look away from the genocide that's happening in Gaza. And, and the reason I wrote the post is just literally I couldn't sleep. Like I, I was seeing these images every day, as many of us are, and just being like, how, how, how can we do work when this thing is happening? Mm. Yeah, and there's something really interesting here. You read, I wasn't ready to see that my friends are brown shirts, which you sort of just uh, mentioned, that they actively cheer on the genocide, the anger, the desire, the need even for retribution against innocent civilians. I wasn't ready for my friends being camp guards, party officials, propagandists. And one thing from the right that's interesting about that is I've basically seen people on the right similarly write that about uh, people that they would consider pro-Palestinian. And I mm-hmm. wanted to ask you, Paul, maybe it's a... Uh, to to talk a little bit about how the polarization on this issue uh, has affected tech, and maybe some of the response that you've gotten since this letter has gone, mm-hmm. this post has gone viral, speaks to that. Uh, because they're they're really I mean, this is really a battle um, ideologically in in so many different sectors, but it's particularly hit tech this time. It it has hit tech. Um, I I think what what we have is that a lot of 
the the top of tech, so investors. They're they're much more right wing. They're much wealthier, and a lot of the bottom of tech um, is is much more left wing, much more liberal. Um, and the center tech is the sort of the founders. Um, the at the start of their career, they are typically I, I would say the the junior founders are more left wing, and the senior founders are more right wing as they get sort of more pulled into the institution that is Silicon Valley. Um, so. It is. It is uh, an an ideological thing, and one, one of the funny things that keeps coming up is is uh, whenever you have Irish people in tech, they are they are predominantly left, um, or they are predominantly on the side of Palestine, and and the reason for that, of course, is that we we were a colony, we were an oppressed people, and we recognize what we see in Palestine, and I think that a lot of the reason that um, that there's so much support for Israel in tech is that. Silicon Valley was, you know, originally it was a, a almost a DARPA creation, right? There, there's a lot of alignment with the defense industry, with sort of um, with U.S. interests. You know, tech is very centered in the U.S., and a lot of the people who are who are senior in tech are, you know, part of the status quo and part of, and and this is even before we 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 get into the the amount of cross investment with Israel and a lot of people making. Um, you know, making money by by doing so. So there's a there's there's definitely a large ideological component to this. Um, the I I suppose that that I realized that, but I was surprised at how much ideology could go and enable the sort of extremist. I mean, I'm just going to call it a genocide because that's what it is that's being enabled by Israel. You, you would think that there were that there were lines that would never be crossed, and and I think that's kind of what surprised me. Yeah, and some some of the comments you you flagged as kind of triggering the post when you mentioned Matt Ako, uh, you linked to one of his tweets um, where he's referring to Palestinians, and he says there's not a lot of innocence. Uh, of the two million routinely cited, a huge majority share 100% of the subhuman goals of Hamas. And he puts uh, "free Palestine" in quotes, um, the, 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 because the cruelty they they delight in the cruelty, the subhuman savagery is intrinsic to the culture and the movement. Really, kind of just literally dehumanizing uh, language coming from you know somebody that you had worked for. So I can imagine where this came from. But I'm curious, you know how. How brutal was this response from people you criticized, and what else did you hear in the wake of this? In the two now, almost two and a half weeks since this, well, the, the, there's been a handful of people um, who I've seen make similar comments uh, to to Madoko, the sort of dehumanizing uh, comments, the sort of the sort of thing. Really, people should, should, regardless of what side you're on, no one should ever say about about another human being. Um, the uh, Tal Broda, it's not someone I know, but it's someone who is pretty senior at OpenAI um, and someone who uh, who was forced to apologize, but wasn't actually removed from his job despite being a very senior executive at OpenAI, which is one of the really important companies in tech right now. He he had, I, I don't have it have a tan, but extremely dehumanizing. In fact, worse worse than Madako, I would say. Another one was Andreas Gal, who, who is a tech CEO, and he was well known for being the CTO of Mozilla. Um, and he said equally dehumanizing stuff weeks ago. And I, I, I challenged him on it on Twitter before he made his account private. The I, I would say that that the majority of what is out there is w- what I would term pro-Israeli propaganda. It is taking the talking points that are coming out from um these, uh, you know, all, all often from from Israel, sometimes from from the IDF, there was this uh, phenomenal uh, discussion, um, Substack by by uh, Lee Fang and Jack Polson, who are who are um, independent journalists, who were who chronicled the story of how Paddy Cosgrave, who's the CEO of Web Summit, how he got taken down, how he got fired. And so you start to see the same strategies and the same talking points coming from many, many different investors. All of a sudden, Harvard was a really, really important thing to talk about. And anti-Semitism universities, that was the real discussion that everyone wanted to talk about. And then you see that spread throughout the New York Times. You see Claudine Gay eventually 
uh, resigned, I think yesterday. You know, this is all part of a, you know, all the same people with the same ideology controlling the conversation and making it impossible to say, well, there's 30,000 people that have been killed by Israel, by Israeli soldiers dropping bombs on apartments. You know, it's like, how is it that, that, that on the one hand, we're talking about that, and on the other hand, you know, everyone's like tweeting about like, oh, from the river to the sea, it's such a, such a triggering term for me, you know? And so since then, you've launched uh, Tech for Palestine. Like, how did, how did that come together? So basically, after, after I posted that blog post, everyone reached out to me. Um, and I just started taking meetings and just talking to people and seeing, you know, I, I had no real plans for it. Um, and what, what happened was I started connecting people together and eventually there became a Discord. Um, and eventually we, we, we launched publicly yesterday um, techforpalestine.org, um, and we had you know another another 300 people join our Discord from the from the original sort of tight group of about 40 people. And basically, there's an awful awful lot of people in tech who are looking to make a difference, who are looking to you know who, who see the genocide that's happening and say this this is not okay, um, and who want to make a difference. And and we're trying to help organize that, um, connect you know, engineers and and others to people who are who are doing projects. Um, and, and run projects ourselves. And all of them are about changing the ability to speak up about Palestine. It has been, you know, as we've seen, it has been okay for people to say massively dehumanizing things so long as they're, um, as, so long as they're pro-Israel. Obviously, we, we don't want and we don't see dehumanizing things being said um, by, um, by the supporters of, of Palestine, but we want to enable people to say genocide is not okay. You know, having normal lives without having bombs dropped on you is a future that we want to see for Palestine and, you know, advocate for um, the end of, of what has been an incredibly long uh, Israeli oppression uh, of the Palestinian people. You mentioned open AI earlier, and it reminded me actually of Elon Musk's involvement both in Ukraine and obviously he famously went over to Israel, I think it was just about a month ago. And so I'm, I'm curious as to, from that 30,000 foot view, um, th these are people, that, the people that you call out, the people that you work around with enormous power, um, and in some cases unregulated power at their fingertips. And this whole experience, um, I'm just curious as to what it tells you maybe about the culture of tech uh, and, and how ideology and power are kind of mingling in one industry uh, with you know potentially devastating consequences with potentially wonderful consequences, um, but but largely in a way that you know makes average people feel powerless uh, in so many different cases. The th there has long been uh, this idea in tech that that we are the people who know better than everyone else. Uh, I would say that the the large shift in tech from about 2007 onwards is that like the doers, the engineers, we're the people who know better than everyone else, and so we we should get to control that. Um, and um, Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, was was a uh, when, when he was leader of um, of Y Combinator, which is one of the most influential sort of um, creator of startups in in the industry. Um, he, he made clear that, oh, the press has turned on Silicon Valley. The press has turned against us. We have to ignore what is being said in, you know, in the population at large and just focus on what we're doing because we know better. You see similar things in, in Facebook. Um, you know, Facebook is, is massively powerful and, and they were led by this internal idea that you know, engagement and making money, those are the things that, that are, are good for us. And that led to um, a genocide in Myanmar. Um, it led, of course, to, to the you know, massive disinformation campaigns over the last couple of US elections. So tech, yes, it is, it is supremely powerful. It is, it is massively unregulated. And now as we're, we're essentially being ushered into this new AI era, um, we see that people at the top of the most important AI organization are um, are incredibly biased, and the bias is is one of the problems that we are going to face uh, throughout this this AI era because the the way that this data is trained, 
how people look at training these AI models. You know, the, the biases of the people who collect and put together the data is reflected in the data. And that, that is, is going to permeate into everything and already has. We're already seeing AI being used to, to target civilians in, um, in Palestine, in Gaza, for example. Or in China, yeah. Yeah, and, and so you talked about how your first company became a, a unicorn. Did that kind of billion dollar valuation enable what you were able to do or how, how difficult has your, has your new company's financial situation been made by your decision to, to speak out? The, I think one of the reasons that I spoke out is, is that I recognized I was in probably the best position uh, from a risk perspective. So uh, as an entrepreneur, I'm pretty risk averse anyway. Sorry, pretty risk tolerant. Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's kind of fine. It's, it's, it's what we do. Uh, but also because I had cashed out a bit of my old company because I didn't have a, you know, a financial risk really. Um, and also my, my new company, Dark Lang, I say it's new, it's seven years old. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's not doing that well. Um, and so our, our next round of funding would have been an angel round anyway. It would have been from, you know, a bunch of high, or mid to high net worth individuals. It wouldn't have been talking to the same investors. Um, and we had a plan to uh, to be cash flow positive and to get off the VC track a little bit anyway. So it was, you know, I was, I was, I was pretty well positioned for it. Um, and so it, it was something where um, where I realized that I had less to fear than most people. And when I posted it and everyone reached out to me and, and tons of people in tech, lots of founders were saying, we can't say anything, you know, th these are our investors. These are the people we're afraid to speak out against, um, even though even though we know what's right. So, you know, it, it's it's clear that that I was one of the few people who who had that risk profile. Um, and, and so it made it easier to um, to take the stand. It's interesting you say that because I kind of feel the same way, sometimes not financially speaking, but uh, the news organization that where I work for, the, the Intercept gives us like total freedom um, to, you know, to say whatever we want about a particular issue, which most journalists don't have. So in some ways I feel kind of obligated to take that opportunity because, because I have less, less risk than, than others mm -hmm. do. It kind of seems like I, so I, I, under, I understand the situation. It doesn't make, doesn't, it, it doesn't make it less nerve wracking or d difficult. Um, but to not have the same kind of immediate consequences makes it more, makes it more doable. Mm. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's, Paul, no, go ahead. Sorry. I know it's, it's 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 funny you mentioned that. I got a I got a piece published about about our new thing, Tech for Palestine, um, published in in TechCrunch yesterday, which is you know having a pro Palestine piece in a tech publication is like rare, um, but at the same time, you know, I, I looked through it and it was, you know, it was edited very carefully to be. Uh, you, I guess what I'm saying is, is, that, is that one can perceive the amount of censorship at news organizations, mm -hmm. like you're saying. Yeah, no mm -hmm. doubt. Well, Paul, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. All right, that'll do it for us this week. Yeah, and you know, Ryan, that's actually... Actually, not for me. I'll be back tomorrow. That's right. You will be back with Crystal, so you're going to have uh, just, just a left full bonanza. lib yeah. show. Yeah, so make sure that you macro dose tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> before you watch Ryan and Crystal uh, talk about, I don't know, presumably... Yeah, you know, Israel-Palestine. Taxes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> More taxes, yeah. You know, you said something interesting there, though, which is it reminds me also that uh, Crystal and Sagar give us really the freedom to do that's what true. we want they, and they say they what we want. They certainly have never suggested that we restrict anything. Yeah. No, sure. that, well, obviously sometimes they force us at, you know, at, at risk of great force uh, to talk about UFOs. <laughs> 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 but no, in, in all seriousness, we're we we're so we're so grateful for that here. And uh, you know, when I I realized I mentioned China in that last interview segment, but it, AI is being used here in the United States to target yeah. civilians as well. Uh, it's we're seeing that deployed all over the world, and so uh, we'll we'll certainly be yeah. covering those things. And to segue into that, it really is the audience that makes it possible. So yes. therefore, yes. Uh, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber. Um, tell them you know Sagar, you'll maybe get a little discount. Yeah, and we're kicking around a little Friday. That's right. Uh, possibility we're that we keep that, forgetting we're that. We're looking at that uh, Friday show. Yes. So keep, 
Keep subscribing. The, the more subscribers we have, the, the more opportunity we have then to do a Friday show. Yeah, and let us know if there's anything that you think would work best or you want us to, to keep in mind as we think about that. We're always happy to hear that. Um, but we will be back here next Wednesday with more counterpoints, more counterpoints in 2024. So we appreciate right. everyone watching. See you later. Hey, if you liked that video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to Breaking Points. If you want to see the rest of counterpoints, go to breakingpoints.com to become a premium member and get the full uncut show every morning in your inbox and on Spotify. Help us build independent news and get the full show every morning at breakingpoints.com.